All right. So with us today, we have John Clegg, who is a senior technical director um, with our group and kind of works across our whole supply chain, jack of all trades. Um, and he is going to talk with you guys about frame rates in video. So um, if you have any questions, you know, John, I'll, I'll leave it to you if you want to hold them to the end or, you know, stop throughout. But without further ado, John, over to you. Hey. Um, hey, guys. Uh, I'm John Clegg, um, and uh, I think I'll start off my slide. I think it's my first slide's about who I am anyway, so we'll just uh, kick it off with that. And I need to enable Zoom to do the desktop, so sorry, one second. <laughs> Let's see if this will work now. Okay, can you guys see it? Yep. All right, great. So, who is this person talking right now? Most of you don't know me. Um, I'm John Clegg. Um, I have been an engineer here at Viacom for five years this March. Um, I've been a software engineer for 23 years. Um, and I haven't always worked with audio and video, but I have done it quite a lot of that time. Um, so, I actually I think frame rates are one of the more fascinating, weird uh, aspects we have to deal with. We have a lot of weird frame rates that seem to come out of nowhere. So this talk is sort of about where those came from and what it means to us now. So, um, well, this is pretty much a duplicate of what I've said. So we'll just go ahead. So, um, you know, what is a frame? Uh, a frame is just a picture. And if I show you one frame and then another frame, and then you quickly go back and forth, it starts to look kind of like motion. And that's hopefully what you guys are seeing here. So how many of these frames do you need? Um, well, most people think that you need about eight frames a second. Uh, most hand-drawn animation is done at about 12 frames a second, which happens to be half of the film frame rate standard. But in this talk, it's not really about what frame rates are best, um, though I will get to that a little bit. Um, as people in the broadcast video world, I was hoping to illuminate a little bit about why and how we have the frame rates that we do. Uh, speaking of illumination, um, this is the... 19, uh, 1893 World's Fair. It was the first big, uh, big public display of electrified light. This was the literal dawn of the electrical age. Uh, Edison and Tesla had been fighting a what war. This was the war if there would be an alternate, uh, an alternative or direct current as a way to power the world. Uh, but why is that important? Um, it's this thing. This is the Tesla polyphrase AC motor. Um, and has a lot to do with why our frame rates are what they are today, why the bulk of the TV catalog that we have is shot the way it is. This is the AC motor that Tesla invented, and it generates alternate, uh, alternating current power. And that power uh, has a frequency. It goes back and forth at some rate. And one of the more popular uses for electricity at the time was generating light. And the frequency of that motor actually had a side effect. Um, this here is an arc light. Uh, before Edison and his light bulb, there are these arc lights. Um, it's a device that makes light by arcing between two carbon electrodes in the air. And with AC power, these lights would flicker as the current alternated back and forth. In the States, we landed at 60 hertz or 60 times a second. And then in Europe, we seem to think 50 hertz would do. But you know, the initial hertz had a lot to do with actually reducing the flicker of these early uh, kind of pre-light bulb lights. So now we have the light, how do we get a picture? Well, if you move a light around really fast on a spinny thing, like you maybe don't with sparklers, you get a streak and you can't tell where the dot is anymore and it makes kind of a neat circle. Um, Right, well, that was kind of dumb, um, but the invention of TV is kind of based on this idea. So let's get a point of light, and then through the magical radio and magnets and cathode ray tubes, we can make that light move really, really fast on a screen. 
Now, here's a little animation of how a CRT or cathode ray tube works. Here you see the electricity powering that tube of light. That light shoots onto this phosphorus screen or a screen with stuff that'll glow for a bit when it gets hit with light. And you see that electricity then has waveforms in it. Coming up in a sec. Oh yeah. And then these are the magnets on the side that actually direct that gun and end up making a picture. And that's how you turn kind of radio into a picture. Right, so we're almost there. Um, I had to get here so we could talk about one of the more interesting and also kind of annoying things about this ancient tech, the stuff that us video people have to deal with today. So we have this light that can paint a picture by moving left and right and up and down, but there's a problem. If a CRT light gun just draws one picture and then another, it'll look like this. One picture just painting after another, fine. We'll just make the phosphors dim quicker so that we don't have it painting on top of each other. But then there's another problem that the picture will fade too fast, once again, causing a problem we've had before, flicker. So how do we get around that? And there was sort of this ingenious idea. They said, what if instead of painting a picture uh, up and down one after another, we drew half the lines the first time and then half the lines the second time, something they decided to call interlacing. So let's see how this looks. Here you can see the little light uh, painting every other line. And then we're still in frame one, now we're painting the second line. And we're painting still on frame one. Okay, now we're finally in frame two, it's starting to fade. And then frame two, and now finally frame three. And this is what interlaced TV would look like if you had like a slow motion camera on it. And that's why we have interlaced video and it's still around today. Matter of fact, um, until the early 2000s, it was all CRT and interlaced video. All the content that leaves a Viacom knock for cable companies and is interlaced and sent as MPEG-2 or H.264 transport stream interlaced video. Even the content that wasn't shot as interlaced will be formatted that way in a codec. Because just like the early lights that dictated the frequency of the power grid and that dictated our frame rates, Old technology dies hard. When they made the new digital standard for TV called ATSC in the 90s, most TVs were CRT, meaning interlaced and most recording broadcast was as well. Right, so where did the 2996 FPS come from? Well, so, you know, you get that you have 60 Hertz become 60 fields and that'll become 30 frames per second, but what is this weird frame rate? So it has to do with color. Um, and this gets super technical, but basically they can hack color TV into the existing signal by using a thing called a signal phase shift. The problem was that people with black and white TVs saw little dots. So the government decided to just change the standard and slow down the frame rate just a little bit. And they made, they landed on this 2996.76 to avoid the problem. How do I move this thing? Anyways. Um, so we have 60 fields a second. So yeah, in America, um, with NTSC and ATSC standards, we don't actually have 60 fields a second or 30 frames a second. We have 29,956 frames a second and 29,912 fields a second. And it's pretty annoying. Well, what about the rest of the world? Outside of America, they pick 50 hertz for their electrical grid. So they have 50 fields or 25 frames a second. They did their color a little bit later and avoided our silly hack to make uneven frame rates. But it's not all rosy for them either, and I'll get to that later. So that's TV. We wanted power. It turns out AC worked better than DC. That meant that lights would flicker. So they picked 60 hertz to avoid the flicker. When it came to make TV, they used that 60 hertz as a basis for how often to draw the picture, except half a picture at a time to avoid flicker, and then annoyingly slowed it down a little bit more for color. What about film? I mean, surely it's not a series of hacks and somehow they ended up on a frame rate to avoid flicker. Yeah. So uh, there was a bunch of pre-mortal film services, but the one that we kind of ended up on is the stuff that has tiny silver highlights in it that do stuff when light hits them. And how fast they do that stuff is the point of this slide, the 400 roll on that film, that's ISO or the speed at which it'll react to light. Um, the first cameras, they didn't have any fancy motors. They were cranked by hand outside by men at random speeds. 
It was literally a guy's hand cranking a film through a lens. Usually they tried to get it somewhere between 12 to 16 frames a second. They couldn't go faster, at least at first, because the film couldn't expose the light fast enough. You can even out outdoors in a really bright environment. If you cranked faster than 16, it would just be too dim because the film just wasn't sensitive enough. What about the old theaters? Well, they were played back somewhere between 20 and 26 frames a second, and again, by hand. Back then, the projectors got a cardio workout all day, cranking it. That means that the motion was much faster than the real life, depending on how fancy or not fancy the place was, depended a bit, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Why do they go faster? Was it just because it was all vaudeville comedy? No, once again, it was about flicker. So here we can see what would happen if you just roll the film over light. It's a big blurry mess. And you can kind of see what goes on, but it's, it's really unpleasant, so we don't want to see that anymore. So here you can see what the film projector actually does. It shows a frame and then it goes black and then it shows a frame and then it goes black. And if you do this fast enough, you don't see the black and you don't get the flicker. And that's why the projectionist would show the movies at a, a faster speed. It was because they needed to go fast enough to avoid the flicker. Oh, and also it made more money. One of the tricks of the low rent Nickelodeons would be to play the films faster so they could get more shows, shorter shows and more shows and more money. Now, all this changed in 1927 with a film called The Jazz Singer. It was the first talkie and it used the revolutionary Vitaphone system. So playback of audio and video, you can't have some guy cranking away at a random speed. You have to sync the audio and the video, which means that the frame rate has to be constant. The story goes that the lead engineer was out at Warner Brothers and asked what frame rates projectionists used. They said, well, the high end ones play around 22 and the lower rent ones play around 26. So they just split the difference at 24. And so that's film. Early silver highlight based film couldn't expose light that fast. So they shot around 16 frames a second and then played it back around 24 frames a second to avoid flicker. Though some places they sped it up a bit more for extra cash. When the talkies demanded a set frame rate, they just picked the average the projectionist used. So what's this thing? Well, this is a weird looking device. This is the first marriage of film and TV and it's called a kinescope. And it was all the rage in the 1940s until the mid 50s. And it's honestly my favorite piece of TV history. Before videotapes, this was it for recording a TV broadcast. Remember, TV is literally just radio that you kind of turn into a picture with tricks with magnets and things. So to capture TV for replaying later, they pointed a film camera in front of a TV, then made copies and flew them all over the world for rebroadcast. And once they're at the destination, they would appoint a video camera at a screen and that's really broadcasting. And at the peak, these things were the largest consumer for film in the world. So how do you convert from 24 to 30? Um, let's see. Now, some of you guys may have seen this. This is called Telecine or 2-3 pulldown. And it's not that hard, but it's a little bit funky. If you look at this picture and you take the first uh, frame and then you make that the first and second field, and then you do the same for the second frame, but on the third frame, you'll take a combination of the second and third frame and the same pattern for the third, and then the pattern repeats itself. Um, so how do you convert from 24 to 25? You know, they watch a lot of American TV in Europe and they have different frame rates. Well, let's see what they do. Yeah, to speed it up. Um, so what that means is that anything shot on film and shown on a PAL TV is sped up. There's not really a good algorithm, at least there wasn't. Maybe they have some sort of fancy way of doing it now, but for a very long time, all the film content was just played back 4% faster. And it changes the sound too. It's slightly higher pitched. Um, a year or two back, I used to go to the London Knock quite a bit, and there's this big fishbowl room with all the TV showing the stations. And there was always an episode of Friends playing, and it's a show shot on film. And I could swear that opening song was sped up just a little bit. What about uh, 60 frames per second to 50 frames per second PAL? Um, another annoyance of American shows on European TV is that if the content was shot at 60, uh, it can't smoothly be translated to 50, field, 50 fields a second easily. So they just have to drop frames or fields and it results in slightly less smooth motion. Well, what about now? 
Well, right now there are two worlds. There's a legacy world of broadcast where everything is still pretty much interlaced at 60 fills per second and the world of film where it's all pretty much 24. And then there's the world of apps and VOD and YouTube. And in the digital world, you can just pick whatever frame rate you want. And around the birth of digital cinema, we could finally untrain ourselves from this 24 frames per second and all this legacy stuff. TVs are coming out with things called true motion that would use fancy motion interpolation to make up new frames in between the actual frames. This creates super smooth and realistic video. It's pretty neat. But then this thing happened. Around in 2012, a film called The Hobbit came out and it made the industry take a pause on this high frame rate video thing. While it's technically superior, most of the audiences and pretty much all the film buffs rejected its silky smooth motion. They said it looked like a soap opera, which is funny because it's exactly right. 60 fills per second has the motion or temporal sampling of 60 frames a set per second. So yeah, it looks a lot like a soap opera. Either way, the audience and critics rejected it and we haven't seen a whole lot of high frame rate movies since. What about now? Well, it depends. Though to my eye, I feel the look of 24 frames per second is more in vogue. Um, but now the directors are free from the legacy constraints. They are free, they're free to experiment. In this Spider-Man, the multiverse movie, let's play it here. Um, the characters have different frame rates in the same shot. Here you can see the movement is slower, maybe 12 frames per second for this character, but the background is silky smooth. And this is used later in the movie to show how the character evolves. Uh, eventually he becomes a high frame rate character. Um, in an animated short, the Gruffalo, since I have a five-year-old, I see a lot of these things. Um, it's done using CG, but they use this animation style, 12 frames per second to make it look like a stop motion. So in the end, I'd like to read one of my favorite quotes. We build our computer and our systems the same way we build our cities, over time, without a plan, on top of ruins. However, now we're mostly free of those ruins, but a lot of the look of TV and film is because of these historical and technical artifacts. I hope this was interesting and I hope it gives a future generation of engineers some framework of how much the decisions they make today can have long lasting effects. And if we have some time, I'd like to open the board for questions. I'm really far from an expert, but I love this topic and I'd love to have any conversation about it. So thank you very much, guys. Thanks, John, that was great. So does anyone have any questions? that John can, you know, provide some insight on frame rates or anything. I have a question, Marissa. Hi, sure. John, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, um, what would be like the impetus for broadcast to um, progress to, you know, a, a new standard? Um, they're working on HTSC three right now, and uh, let's see, they they're they're supporting all kinds of new standards there. So I think if uh, you know once ATS three becomes standardized, I think uh, there there would be a, a freedom there for them not to stick to those old interlaced uh, frame rates. I think technically it's possible with ATSC 2.0, but the industry, the de facto industry standard doesn't really allow it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Hey John, I had one real quick also, um, just on the topic of true motion and- um, Yes. Kind of, the, I know that's kind of a, a controversial thing because some people really hate it. Some people really love it and makes people mm -hmm. dizzy. I'm kind of going through it a little bit right now myself, um, but can you just explain a little bit about why something like that is, does, thing, does something like that get applied to say broadcast versus something that's, you know, a, a super, you know, high def like Dolby Vision or something like that where I'm streaming? Like how, so, what's the differences as far as that goes? So I, I'm just guessing as to how this works, but um, my guess on how this works is that the T, this happens at the TV layer. So outside your set top box or Apple TV or whatever you have, the TV um, does know what frame rate it's supposed to be playing. And I think it specifically looks for 24 frames per second content and then applies a certain algorithm to upsample it to probably like 48 or something like that. Um, and what it's gonna do is look at two different frames and then just kind of make up an in-between frame using some kind of motion interpolation. Um, I don't think it does it for anything higher than 30 or 
or, or 30 probably doesn't bother touching, but uh, 24 frames per second. Um, and I think it does it for animation too. I see, I've seen it do it for uh, 12 frames per second where it will try to make up in between frames and make it look a lot smoother. So if okay. you're watching sports or something or you know, uh, uh, cable news or something like that, those are all shot at 60 fields. So I don't think it would do anything for those. those the 60 fields per second already looks very smooth. All right, any other questions? <laughs> 